Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our official launch event today. I am really thankful to have you guys join, to take time out of your day to be able to do this uh, and to support an important cause that we are sponsoring today. I am joined today by a few folks uh, that I'll introduce and, and introduce again later on when they do their segments. Uh, but I wanted just to give a, a quick introduction to a couple of folks that are with me today. We have Dr. Santos from the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. We have Carolyn Diaz, also from the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Jamie Hahn, who is the CEO and owner of ASI Consulting. I'll, I'll share a little more about Jamie uh, later. And, uh, and joining us shortly will be Dr. Nali, uh, also from the Cleveland Clinic. And so I'll talk about their segments in a moment. Today, we have um, a really good, I think, agenda for you guys. And, and uh, I'll walk through a little bit of each of the pieces uh, of, that we're going to be sharing. And then we're also going to be um, involving you uh, as an audience uh, into some of the things that, um, that you'll be able to learn today. So first, we're going to do an overview of the site itself. And it's really my intention that we give you kind of a virtual tour of it without necessarily having to lean on technology too much. Uh, to go through it. So we'll give you a little bit of virtual tour. We're going to have you test your knowledge and learn a little bit. We've got some polling questions that we're going to ask you about. You'll hear from our doctors today and just share a little bit of their perspective. And we'll also allow for you to ask some questions. Uh, some of you have already submitted some questions in advance, which we appreciate. Uh, but we we'll also be able to uh, ask live questions today. And then we'll wrap up. We've got some thanks and then an ask uh, that we want to make of you. So those that know me well know that I am a person of intention. And one of the first things I like to also always talk about is what is, what is our intention? So really our intention for this work, as you can see from the screen, is really to, to serve as a guide. Uh, this is something that I wanted to be able to bring to life based on my own experience of what I've been going through the last two and a half years and really being able to create a platform where breast cancer patients, their loved ones, their caregivers, and the community at large can come to and find answers in an easy way and be able to really be guided through the treatment process as well as the ongoing care process. So the intention for us is really to serve as that guide and to do so through some of the tools that we've created on this site. So first, I wanna break down a little bit of how the site is configured. The site really has essentially three key pillars that are underpinned by one concept, which is the overall guide. So how we work is we've got one section of the site that is really considered the insights. And this is really where we have a lot of articles, we have tools and practices that people can use to be able to facilitate their, their treatment journey and to do so as best as possible. So that's really the insights bucket. The second bucket are the rooms. And this is a space that we've created to have different experiences for people, whether it is a technique or whether it is a product or whether it is uh, a process that, that we find helpful for people to use that really lives inside the rooms. And the last section of the pillars is the humor, because one of the things that I have found is so important as you're going through something so serious as the cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment is to be able to find the spots along the way that give you humor and allow you to have some levity in how you manage through all of this and how your loved ones manage through it as well. So I'll talk about the humor piece in a second. All of this is underpinned by the guide and the guide is really a booklet. It is a, a playbook that we are creating that will lean on all of the pieces of these three insights and also be something that caregivers, patients, loved ones can use to again, help facilitate how you go through this. What are the steps that, that matter and how do you do this uh, in as easy as way as possible for not only the patient, but also the network that is around them. So let's go inside each one of these and, and get a little bit more perspective. First, in the insight. So I talked about the insights are really more around tools and articles. So these are basically the first part of the insights, which are the blogs. And these are based on personal experience with so things that I have gone through as a patient over the last two and a half years. I am still on treatment today, as many of you know. And this is a way to at least get people started, to get people to understand what are the initial steps, what are some things that you may encounter, and what are some watch outs or, you know, for lack of a better word, best practices that I have certainly found helpful and those around me have found helpful that can help people also do the same and be able to do so with ease. 
one of the challenges that often happens, and I found this personally as a patient, is that while there's a lot of information on the internet around cancer treatment, breast cancer prevention, et cetera, it is often overwhelming and it is often all over the place. So our intention is to be able to have this live in a space that is organized, that is easy to navigate and also easy to digest. And we feel that the blogs and the insights corner is the first step in being able to do some of the, that very intention. The second piece of the pillars that we talked about are the rooms. And so in the rooms, we have three. And we have these, what we call, we're calling the breathe, the beautify, and the be, right? So the breathing room, the beauty room, and the being room. The breathing room uh, is a space where we will have tools and practices that help patients understand the value of using their breath and doing breath work to help with not only managing some of the really strong side effects that are part of the treatment process, but also being able to have that space help from a, a calming perspective and being able to, to navigate some of the ups and downs that invariably happen when you're going through treatment or when you are supporting someone that is. So that's the breathing room. The beauty room is one where patients and loved ones and caregivers can find tips around how do you manage the, the process of the changes that happen to your body when you are going through cancer treatment. And it is an ongoing, it, and it is a constant thing. And one of the most common things that people immediately realize is that cancer patients lose their hair, but not all cancer treatments are, are work the same and some create different kinds of side effects. So in the beauty room, we have not only tips, but we also have products that I have found have helped me maintain my skin, maintain the, you know, the quality of, of my hair and some of the other aesthetics that I'm hoping will also serve that same purpose for others that visit. And then the being room is a space where you can also find strength through others. So this is a space where not only will people be able to share their stories and their own journeys, but also things that have worked well for them. So it is a space where people can go and find from a community practices and, and tips that are really helping people. And if nothing else, also be able to feel a collective of I'm in this space and I have others that are also in this space with me. So that's really the, the concept of the rooms. It's more about an experience more so than just tools and tips. And then the humor. So those of you that know me well, you know, I like to laugh. I like to be able to find the funny things in life. And I also like to, to name things because I think that sometimes when you give something a, a name, you give it a meaning and, it, and you give it life. And so we have the corner of the humor here, which is called Consolama's Corner. And the reason we picked a llama is because one, I, I love llamas. I've always been very intrigued, um, not only by their fortitude, but also by just their no nonsense um, personality. And I think people know that about llamas and respect that about llamas. I also think you can't look at the face of a llama and not smile. And so for me, it just kind of all came together. Um, and Consuela is a name that I used many years ago. Those that knew me back then knew that I like to call that my, my laptop Consuela. So the combination of, uh, of Consuela and the llama forms Consuelama. And in this corner, um, we are dedicated solely to stories and to, and to articles that make people laugh. And so the first few that are posted here are based on my own experiences of things that I've gone through that brought humor uh, in the face of something so serious. Uh, but it's also through that humor that you're often able to get to the other side and to be able to actually get through it. And so again, the intention for this corner is for folks to be able to come in and read some stories that will make you laugh, share your own stories that are intended to create humor and levity so that it isn't always so dark and so serious that it could also be something light and it can also give people courage and encouragement to be able to keep going. So that's really the piece of the Consolama Corner and how we bring humor into this. What's coming next? So we have a couple of things that are coming next. You know, one is inside, in, underneath the insights corner that I talked about, we have a toolkit that is going to contain a few key pieces that we'll add to this. And our releases to this site 
who will be on a seasonal basis. So this is a very much a starting point for us. And we wanted to get this launch to at least get this going and to really feel that we were creating a space of value for people. Our intention is to continue to grow and expand this work and to release seasonal um, pieces that will continue to help people in that journey. So the first one will be the winter 2021 release, which will contain, as you can see here, a few key toolkit items. We're going to have some checklists in there because checklists are important. Not everyone wants to have a litany of information or have to comb through a number of things. Checklists are helpful to be able to say, if I do nothing else, maybe these are the five or, or six things I need to take to the first visit, or here are some of the things I need to do as I'm going through my treatment. And so that'll be one piece that, that we'll be adding that today isn't yet um, on the site. Books are a really big deal to me. Those of you that know me well know that books are my life. And so I want to be able to share with people that visit this site some of the books that I have found very helpful. And some of these will be very much books that are focused on the cancer treatment journey itself. But there also will be books that don't have anything to do necessarily with cancer, but they're good reads and nice ways to kind of get your mind off the day to day and what has to happen with this with this process. We're also going to be launching into podcasts. So we're going to be doing our first podcast uh, in November and we'll continue to do podcasts on a regular basis. Our intention is to also be able to, like we're doing today, bring in some people that can provide some expert perspective and provide us with context around um, how it can help others and also just to have a little bit of fun. And then again, we'll also have to kind of wrap everything up a newsletter. We know that not everyone likes or needs to go through all the pieces of a site. And so being able to package into a newsletter that gives the key pieces and the key tips or that helps people really organize how they plan for this um, will be part of what the newsletter will serve. And then the other piece, again, as part of our seasonal uh, releases for the spring of, of this upcoming year will be the actual guide. And so this guide, which we're calling the, the breast cancer guide, is really an actual book. It is a book that will also allow people to have kind of a companion journal where they can document their, you know, their treatment process and their steps. And again, it's something that is just a way to synthesize all of this content that exists everywhere and be able to do that in a way that is easy for the people that are going through it or for the people that are helping them get through it. A lot of times the caregivers also need a lot of this perspective that they don't often have. So that's basically you know, how the site itself is gonna work and what are the component parts you know, of, of the site. Uh, we are also gonna send you, I know we had sent you some of the information around the link itself. We're gonna send you the link to the site at the conclusion of this uh, webinar so that you can also navigate through it as well in, in its entirety. But one of the things we wanted to do was also kind of get you involved um, in, in some activity. And one of the ways to do that obviously is to test your knowledge. So we are going to ask three questions. And so in the webinar itself, as a participant, you should be able to see an icon that says polling. And so if you click on that polling, it'll, it will come up with a few questions that we are going to ask today. And so if you are all able to do so, and if you're not, no worries, we will we will um, we'll, uh, test your skills in a different way. So we're gonna launch the poll. And so we are gonna show you all three questions and then I'm gonna talk about each of these and show the answer. So the first question you see there, you should be seeing it now is in 2021, approximately how many women and men are expected to be diagnosed with breast cancer in the US? And you see there, you have a few choices. You've got you know, the first choice, second, third, and fourth. So you can go ahead and start submitting. I see some people are already submitting their answers. Very good. There is then, uh, so that's the first question. How many men and women expected to be diagnosed? Next question, some people are already uh, rolling ahead. The, the advanced gifted students always trying to get in front of it. On average, what percent of breast cancer patients develop metastatic breast cancer? That is cancer that has spread from the breast to other parts of the body. So you can submit your questions there. I see people are rolling along answering their questions. What percent goes into the other parts of the body? Okay. And then the third question is on average, what percent of the funds raised for breast cancer research are focused on metastatic breast cancer? 
And you see the choices there, 50, 30, five, or 25%. Okay. So I'll let you guys submit your answers. We don't have the traditional um, Jeopardy music that often plays in the background when there are surveys being taken, but nonetheless, I think you can understand the spirit. Hopefully everybody got in their answers to all three questions. Okay. All right, so I see that the buttons have stopped. So I'm gonna end the poll now. Hopefully I don't um, mess it up, Jamie and team, when I do this, I am new to the polling process, okay? So we see the people that, we had 19 folks that voted. Um, so I'm going to share the results with you guys. Hopefully you can see this in a second, okay? So the first one, the first um, answer to the first question is 281,550 new cases. Do you see that a lot of people got that answer correct? To give you context around what this means, when you look at the roughly 284,000, when you combine the women and the men that are expected to be diagnosed this year, it is the equivalent. If you were to take the, the four largest universities in the United States and you combined their total population, that is the equivalent of the number of people women and men that are expected to be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. And kind of let that sit in for, sink in for a minute for you to realize just the impact of what we're talking about for just one year's time, what is expected to happen. Um, it is really, uh, to me, unbelievable. The second answer uh, to the question was what percentage of breast cancer patients develop metastatic? So metastatic, again, once it has spread um, to other parts of the body, the answer is the 30%. So 30% of people that are diagnosed with breast cancer will develop metastatic breast cancer um, as part of their um, treatment or their overall diagnosis, I should say. And that's a startling number when you think about the, the fact that that means that it has spread to other parts of the body. And then the last question was, on average, what percent of funds raised for breast cancer research are then focused on metastatic? And the answer is 5%. So I see many people got that answer correct, 5% of the total research. When you think about 30% of people will develop it, but yet only 5% of the funding is going to metastatic research, um, that has to change. And that's really one of the many reasons why not only I chose to begin this work, but also the organization that we selected today uh, for the, the recipient, recipient of all of these donations is Metaviver. And Metaviver is an organization that is solely focused to driving research towards metastatic breast cancer. And one of their beliefs, and I agree, is that by the same token, that 30% of people that are diagnosed with breast cancer will develop metastatic breast cancer. By that same token, then at least 30% of the research should also be pivoted towards metastatic disease. And so the, the, you know, the collection of money that we did for today, um, and I'm very excited that we are actually already exceeding our goal. Um, many of you obviously made a significant impact in us being able to do so. It is the first event that we've hosted and the first time that we're actually doing this kind of donation. So to be able to start strong um, and to exceed the goal is, is something that, you know, that I thank you guys very much for, for one, taking seriously and two, for wanting to be a part of this. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll now and, um, and kind of go through the, the, the next part of this. Um, so again, we had, I had the test uh, questions in here and then I also um, was going to share with you guys the, the actual answers which we've just gone through. So I wanted to go through the next part of our presentation and just give me one second. We're going to get to that. The computer is not our friend all, the, all of a sudden. Okay. So we have the answers, which we already shared with you guys. And next we get to hear a little bit from our doctors. So we have two folks joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna start first with Dr. Santos because Dr. Nali uh, is joining us shortly. She's had a little bit of uh, a last minute um, scheduling emergency, but she is gonna be joining us shortly. But we're, I'm pleased today to have uh, these two folks from, from the Cleveland Clinic, Florida, who have played a really significant part in my life. Um, let me just share a, a little bit here because I think you know, many times we hear um, from doctors and in many times when we do so, um, it is just a, you know, 
a, a perspective of you know, here's a, a few folks that we asked to join us. And while these two individuals obviously bring a tremendous amount of expertise, they also have played a significant role in my life um, because I know that without their care, I would not be able to do what I'm doing today, nor would I be where I am today. Um, and so for Dr. Nali, obviously having been my oncologist for the last two and a half years that I've been in treatment, Dr. Santos, who uh, came into my life last year as the cancer was completely out of control and I was in, in an extremely difficult place. Um, it is important for me for you to know that I am very open about the fact that the treatment that I receive, I have chosen to also include as part of that treatment, a psychologist um, and to be able to have that open dialogue about the fact that psychology is an important part of how you treat this disease. And there is so much associated at times with you know, what I call the shame of being diagnosed with a serious illness, because normally the patient goes through a number of thoughts around the things that they could have done differently. And when you couldn't have done anything differently in your mind, then you're left with this perplexing thought of what exactly happened here. And so to be able to cope with all of that, in addition to the, you know, the medicinal part and what it means to have you know, treatment uh, from an oncology practice, I believe firmly that we have to to tear down the the stigma that that is associated with having a psychological part and having psychology as part of your therapy. So one of the reasons why I wanted for Dr. Santos to speak today was one, not only for me to be open about how I have managed my care because that's the intention of us being able to guide people through this. Uh, but also to be able to have him share his perspective and his insights on, on the whole psycho-oncology side and what that means for patients. And so again, as we're educating and sharing a little bit today, I wanted to be able to do that. So we're going to open with Dr. Santos, have him share some pieces of, as we're waiting for Dr. Nali to join. Um, we also have Caroline Diaz from Cleveland Clinic, Florida, who is part of Dr. Nali's team and also has a great deal of expertise around this space. Um, so first and foremost, Dr. Santos, welcome, bienvenido. Um, it is my pleasure that you're here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand the, the, uh, the controls over to you. And so I'll stop my sharing now and hand over to you. So welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction there, Amelia. Let me get this going here. Just to double check, can everybody see my screen or Amelia, can you see it? Yes, we absolutely sure. can. Yes. Absolutely. Technology is not <laughs> going against me today. It is not always okay. a good friend, exactly. Not really. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to uh, open up and say, well, I, I'm Dr. Santos. Uh, I've worked alongside Amelia and helping her, you know, throughout a difficult moment in her life. But when she told me she embarked on this project and this website, I knew how much it would help people, especially even patients of mine, patients of the Cleveland Clinic. So I'm definitely glad and excited to be here and, and see her, you know, uh, have this website and project to almost completion. I know we're going to be waiting on those uh, seasonal updates. So I just wanted to say that before I get started. So today I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, breast cancer and the importance of psycho-oncology. Many of you uh, may have not even heard that term before, but it's the field of oncology that meets psychology. So it's psychotherapy, right? Just, you know, talk therapy within the field of oncology. And uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about that. So who am I? I'm a clinical psychologist in the Marooning Cancer Center at Cleveland Clinic at Weston. And so my focus throughout my whole career has been on health, uh, most recently oncology, and then I have a focus on end of life as well as grief and bereavement. So these are topics that sometimes come up with my patients as I help them through, again, a uh, new diagnosis, if they're going through chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, et cetera, that sometimes do come up when they, you know, even question their mortality when they hit, when they hear that big C word, okay? So we'll just definitely get into it here. So um, breast cancer, as we all know it, is a threat to our life and our livelihood. And so a lot of folks, you know, experience a lot of losses and fears, loss according to their health. I've had patients come up to me and tell me, hey, you know, I was very healthy. I did all the right things. I was exercising, eating healthy. I was sleeping well. I was doing all the right things. And then cancer happened. And so it's definitely 
perceived as even a, a, a you know, a bereavement process where we, you know, mourn our loss of health. And sometimes we run into issues with our jobs and careers, uh, financial planning, all these things can come up with a new diagnosis. Some folks have told me, hey, you know, I've lost very close relationships with family or friends as I walk through this cancer journey because I didn't imagine that they were not be as helpful as I thought and as supportive as I thought. And so sometimes there uh, is the sense of uh, these questions about our mortality. Will it be affected? Is our longevity affected? How do we cope with this? How do we deal with all this? So definitely breast cancer is, you know, a threat to our life in more ways than one. And of course, with um, breast cancer, there's always this sense of uncertainty, uncertainty about the future, uh, uncertainty about side effects, uncertainty about interactions of other illnesses. And of course, like I said before already, the future. What, what will happen to me? What, what, where would I be headed now? Has my path changed? And so all these things are, are things that we talk about in the field of psycho-oncology with patients. So moving on just a little bit here, some of you have probably heard some of these uh, words before. So with breast cancer, there is definitely uh, mental health issues associated to it. So with diagnosis and treatment, um, some people face stress, acute or chronic, uh, depression, sometimes questions of suicidality come up as well as anxiety in the form of panic attacks or acute anxiety, as well as trauma. And so these are kind of the clinical words that I use with folks in the therapeutic Milu to talk about what's going on. And so I want to go into each one of it, uh, like stress, depression, anxiety, just a bit here so everybody can know what I'm talking about. So with um, stress in breast cancer, right, there is a uh, life change. So there's that loss of health, uh, potential loss of job, financial difficulties, relationship issues, uncertainties of hospitalizations. We, we don't know what'll happen, um, how long our surgery, uh, if we do have surgery, how long that'll be, how long will be the recovery period. So there's a lot of questions there. And I always advocate for, for patients to you know keep an open dialogue between them and their providers and, and reach out anytime they need questions answered. So many times there's even stress regarding reduced access to care, loss of community, and so the stress can be traumatic depending on the severity of each one of these events. There are folks who, you know, with the uncertainty of hospitalization or treatment can even mistrust their providers. And so those are things that we talk about in therapy. So uh, with breast cancer, of course, we do need to talk about depression because some people face this from time to time. So there is the sense of increasing isolation and loneliness and uh, ruminative thoughts about jobs, finances, right? Uh, hopelessness or worthlessness, loss of motivation, not only because of uh, mental health issues, but it could be due to even fatigue from some therapies, radiation, chemotherapy. And then sometimes there is that sense of, oh, um, I wish I wasn't here. I wish I didn't have to deal with that. So we do talk about suicidality in regards to, is it, you know, passive or active and addressing that in therapy is always helpful. And with breast cancer, of course, uh, like I said, we'll talk a little bit about anxiety. Um, this is the one that I, I gotta say in my experience, I've heard of the most. So it's living with fear and uncertainty in terms of worries or loss of control, um, the sense of restlessness or tension or panic. Like I wanna do something, I sense an urgency. Uh, I wanna uh, you know, defeat this monster as fast as possible. So even with that being said, um, sometimes even facing the loss of control, it's focusing on the things we can control, right? So diet, exercise, and all those things that we'll talk about soon. All right. So with breast cancer, there is um, trauma, unfortunately. So with trauma, you can think of it as persistent emotional distress. So there's long lasting effects of depression and anxiety. If it goes on, let's say an initial diagnosis, uh, throughout treatment or surgery, right, depending on which one comes first, or uh, radiation as well. And then there are these senses and awareness of physical vulnerabilities that increases our existential anxieties of value, meaning, and purpose that a lot of folks run into and feel like, hey, now I have to address them. Uh, I thought my life was going one way, and right now I I'm valuing things. 
and finding meaning in other avenues that I didn't before. So there's also a compounded issues that can be due to ongoing unrelated diagnoses or treatment uh, related stress. And so I wanted to switch gears and kind of uh, mention that throughout breast cancer diagnosis, right, um, we can keep positive so we can bounce back. There's a lot of things in terms of human resiliency uh, where we can focus on self-care, build towards a strong community, a lasting community. We have uh, maybe different perspectives on life. And then we kind of look back at value and meaning and decide, you know, what changes we've made and what changes do we want to make. And so there's that sense of keeping positive and bouncing back. And so I wanted to go into a little bit of the healthy coping. So some folks um, switch to value-based living. And these are things that sometimes I do talk about with folks. Um, so that's focusing on habits that add meaning to our life. So learning a new language, right? Cooking, gardening, writing, all these different things. Or focusing on project and attainable goals. Um, they can be even small things when we, you know, go through this process. Uh, focus on simple joys, right? So dancing, laughing, spending time <laughs> with folks, uh, playing with your kids, uh, being with your pets, and all that. Okay. And so also, you know, connecting with others, social support, sometimes it's something we don't talk about enough. So it's reaching out to family and friends. And even uh, throughout the pandemic here, I know our numbers are getting better, but I know with patients, even of mine, I always still say, hey, you know, be careful, wear a mask, all those good things. So you know, having that virtual communication. And I know people, sometimes they connect virtually and they sometimes, you know, dance together, watch movies together. You know, they're part of interest groups online, maybe even support groups, and maybe even do some yoga <laughs> virtually. All right. So some other healthy coping strategies is uh, what I call routine maintenance. So it's limiting procrastination, you know, having a bedtime, not skipping meals, practicing personal care, eating healthy, and doing some light to moderate exercises, yoga, I mentioned before, but it's one of uh, the better things out there, I would say in terms of even mental health and incorporating meditation and doing breathing exercises. And so this is one of the things that I always tell folks to do. I do it myself, expressing appreciation and gratitude. And so it's keeping a gratitude journal. Uh, so stating three things that you're grateful for in the morning, like sunshine, right? Others, my family, right? Those type of things. And then one of the last things I wanted to mention here is um, the stigma with psycho-oncology. So that's uh, therapy embedded in the field of oncology. So you, there is a big push of uh, moving away and removing the stigma of psychotherapy uh, within the field. And because a lot of patients tell me, hey, I need the support and guidance. And I, I need the assistance you know, through a difficult moment in my life. So I always relate even therapy as um, check-ins for our mental health. And so many times I urge folks to, you know, check in with a psychologist, um, even if you're, uh, you're not at the Cleveland Clinic, but, you know, your facility has a social worker or even a mental health counselor that are therapists um, in the master's level to check in with them and see, you know, how it is you're doing and have that self-reflection. So a lot of folks ask me this question <laughs> in therapy, usually during the first consult, Am I going crazy? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, long answer is we're adjusting, right, to a major life event here that sometimes we have little to no experience. So it is definitely helpful to, again, uh, self-reflect, and check in, see how you're doing, and have a console. And you may need to go well, once a week, maybe twice a month, maybe it's once a month, or even once every three months, just to have that check-in to see how you're doing. So, uh, Depression and anxiety are to be expected. So again, important to self-reflect, seek assistance with a mental health professional like myself, or if your facility has, again, social worker or uh, mental health counselors. So I wanted to just leave this up for a minute there. Um, it's the, these are all hotlines for our disaster distress helpline because I know we live in South Florida <laughs> and I wanted to have that out there because if, there's, if we're faced with any natural disaster, there's the number, uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline, it's up there, National Domestic Violence Hotline, Child Abuse Hotline, Sexual Assault uh, Hotline, and Elder Care Locator. Because even though right, a person or a patient may be going through uh, breast cancer care or treatment in any which way, life still happens. And so we need to make sure we know where 
who to reach out to when we need help. All right, so I wanted to, you know, thank everybody for being here and thank Amelia for making this wonderful website. And I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Dr. Nali, which I think connected while I was speaking. So I'm gonna stop sharing and allow uh, Dr. Nali to pick it up. So thank you, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can you see me? We can. Yes. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for uh, the kind invitation. And I'm very um, honored to be uh, to be able to join in today. Um, I'm here to try to answer some of your questions. Um, and I can give an overview from my perspective. Uh, I really second everything that Dr. Santos have said. Um, cancer uh, care is a partnership between um, the patient, obviously, their families and loved ones, and the cancer team, the treatment team that involves the doctors like myself, but also the nurses, nurse practitioners, psychologists, and uh, a really an army of, uh, of uh, staff who work together uh, to make things work from radiologists to pathologists to lab people to nurses to schedulers. So we are all here to support, uh, to support the patients. And it's really a partnership that, that really leads to the best results. So just a few words about myself. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm a breast medical oncologist, which means I only care for breast cancer patients. And I've, only, I've done this for the past almost 20 years now as a medical oncologist, um, learning uh, about breast cancer, researching breast cancer, and really understanding uh, or trying to understand how we can help patients with breast cancer throughout their journey and improve outcome for this uh, very prevalent disease. It's the most common cancer in the world for women. The good news is that cancer uh, survival has improved, as you, you may know. Uh, currently, we have more than 3.8 million survivors of breast cancer in the United States. And the majority of these patients are living long, long life with a good outcome, a good prognosis. Uh, this is due to treatment, a better treatment, better care, um, and uh, really more options than we had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Even for stage four and metastatic breast cancer now, we have so many new choices and people are living longer uh, lives and good quality of life because our goal is not just to, to prolong life, uh, but also to provide or to be able to help patients um, go through a good quality of life. Um, everything helps. Every uh, effort that the patients are doing and the physicians and the team uh, together uh, really provide the best outcome. And not only just prolonging life, but living a fulfilling life. What Amelia is doing today in her um, group is really uh, what inspires a lot of uh, people to continue the fight and not to despair. While Dr. Santos, the tips he is giving also support the fact that, you know, it can be done. It can be, uh, anxiety can be reduced by focusing on what matters, on the small things and the small wins instead of just worrying about the future, because sometimes in this disease, it's not always, you cannot always predict what will happen. Every patient is different. Uh, what I would like to caution people is to not to compare. Comparisons create the most anxiety I've seen in patients where someone will be doing great and they say, oh, well, my, my, my uh, sister-in-law's grandmother had cancer, but she didn't do well, or, or she got this treatment and didn't do well. And so we want to avoid comparisons, focus on your, your health and what you can do, because it can be, this disease is very different. 
between one person to another. It is heterogeneous. It's not one size fits all. And uh, try really not to get the, the information that could be misleading um, because it's such a prevalent disease and such a, um, I would say, um, not so accurate facts are out there. So always try to double check with your treating team, uh, try to use the resources uh, you have available to you, try to, to go to support groups. Many patients with, especially with stage four breast cancer, decide to isolate instead of communicate with others because they feel it's too, uh, they don't wanna hear others, they don't wanna be discouraged. And sometimes that's okay, but try not to isolate completely. Try to always try to find information. There will always be people who, who are re ready to support and there are always people who will find meaning in supporting you. And that will be uh, really, you're, you're doing them a favor if you allow them in your life. Uh, of course, it's not for everybody. Not everyone is good with support groups. But we've done a, uh, a support group with Dr. Santos leading, uh, it's called Survive and Thrive. And I've had a lot of patients who are skeptical and initially they don't wanna join in, it's now virtual. Because of that, because they wanna hear something that will be discouraging or, or you know, depressing. But many people benefited uh, from the experiences of others. So try to, to reach out. Uh, in terms of treatment options, for example, we have new medication that we never had before just over the past five years. For example, for triple negative breast cancer, that is a very uh, aggressive type. And before it was only chemotherapy. Now we have so many targeted options. Immunotherapy came uh, in the game. For HER2 positive breast cancer, again, we had only one or two drugs and chemotherapy. Now we have at least six or seven new options for targeted agents. And in addition, we have a new clinical trial that is combining uh, immunotherapy with anti-HER2 therapy. So the field is going toward more personalized care, uh, less aggressive chemotherapy, but more targeted and biological and molecularly driven treatment options. For, her to, for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, we only give uh, hormonal therapy for the past well, 20 years. Uh, we had uh, limited options. Now we have new medications, CDK46 inhibitors in advanced and in early stage breast cancer, which is a, a great uh, progress. So we have many new treatment options. Research is ongoing for this disease. Uh, uh, patients are uh, benefiting from all the progress made. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what you as a patient, how you are going to support uh, yourself and how are you gonna partner with your doctors to improve you know, your outcome by uh, compliance with treatment, but by finding ways to reduce stress and anxiety, focusing on, uh, on what, what's relevant uh, and trying to avoid uh, unnecessary stresses and worries about well, what can come in the future. So I'm ready to answer any questions and I hope uh, this, uh, this is helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Nali um, and Dr. Santos. Uh, I think before I hand over to Jamie, who's going to facilitate the Q&A, like I said, we had some questions submitted in advance. So we're gonna start with those and we've got, I know other folks that want to ask some questions, but I wanted to take a moment and just to uh, recognize you both again for not only taking the time to share your expertise today and to provide this context, but just for the, the work that you do. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I owe my life and my well-being to both of you. And I know that I would not be able to do any of what I'm doing if it weren't for you. Um, you know, one, Dr. Nali, for, for finding the, the, you know, the chemical combination that has been able to contain a, a, a such an aggressive cancer, as you know, I have been battling. Um, and Dr. Santos, for being able to help me 
you know, understand how to process all of this. Because even though, you know, many people that know me see me as a very positive person and I tend to, to always lean on that, um, I know that I was not in that place last year. And, um, and had I not had the kind of care that I've had both, you know, again, the oncological care that, that, that has been provided as well as the psychological care uh, and what you've brought as a team uh, to my treatment, I, I would not be, I would not be where I am. Uh, th that is, there's no doubt of that in my mind. And so part of what I'm trying to do with this work is also to pull on some of these things that you're sharing today and to be able to shine a light on resources that people often find so overwhelming and being able to kind of break that down into easy pieces so that people can actually understand how do I do this? Or if for those that are on today that I know a couple of folks that are joining um, are people whose family member is going through it um, or has just been diagnosed is for them to kind of get an early start on how do you start to get the right team of people around you so that you can manage your care in the right way. So I, I, I cannot say enough about, um, about both of you as well as Caroline, who's on the phone today as well from Dr. Nally's team. Um, so Jamie, I'll hand over to you to facilitate the questions. I know we've had some that were submitted in advance, so I'll hand the floor back over to you. Yes, thank you. And for those that do want to submit questions, uh, there is a Q&A bar at the bottom. And all you do is just click on that and then it'll submit the questions directly to me. If we do not get to your question today, we will be posting those on the website this week. So just know that ahead of time. Uh, but the first question that I want to ask, and this will go to, um, to everyone on all the panelists, um, what we'll, we'll start with Dr. Nolly. What is the one thing that you would advise to all recently diagnosed patients? Dr. Nolly? The one thing uh, that I... Hello? Yes, we can, can hear you. Me? Okay. Yeah, so one thing I would advise is to uh, really um, get enough information and um, try not to get misinformation. Um, and like I said before, try not to compare because every single case is really different. Breast cancer is so different. It's so heterogeneous. And what works for some patient may not work for you. And try to get the information from your uh from your team of, uh, of physicians and, and staff, because they have the best, uh, the, you know, your best interest in mind. Try to partner with your uh, treating team. I think that will be my, my best advice. Sometimes when, when patients don't have the trust or they don't, they start to go out for multiple opinions and multiple, you know, uh, they get more confused than they, they get really uh, so it's good to have the information, but once you decide on a treatment, work with your doctors, work with your, with your team, instead of trying to jump from one place to another, because that's really sometimes can not always be very helpful. Uh, and that will lose the continuity of care, which is crucial in this disease. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Santos? Yeah, I just had to unmute myself there. No, I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Nali is saying. It's one of those things, even when we talk about anxiety and uncertainty um, and fears, that's, that's one of them. Like, am I doing what I need to for myself in this moment? And they sense that, 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 that urgency. And so what Dr. Nali is saying, even from a medical perspective, even when we go to the mental health side, it's you know, following through uh, with your doctor and have that open line of communication which I'm definitely an advocate for. And I'm glad that, you know, most of my patients, I hear, hey, we collaborate together with our medical team and they're there for us and um, have that, again, open line of communication. I know our mitra system is great just because we can <laughs> have that open dialogue uh, many times where, you know, a patient might have a, a question after hours, that kind of thing, and we get back to them as soon as we can. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Amelia? I would say, in addition to what Dr. Nali and Dr. Santos said, is as a patient, and this is you know kind of from my own path, um, I think you have to get organized as to how you're going to think about your 
your your journey. Um, you one of the first things that I that I heard from someone that I value greatly, who was a, a multi multi year. Um, uh, multi-decade, I should say, survivor was first, do not overwhelm yourself. It's easy to become overwhelmed because you're, you don't anticipate something like this. I certainly didn't. Um, and so don't overwhelm yourself. And then also just start to plan and gather your, your thoughts, your, your information that you're going to need to be able to do this. But then once you have made a decision as to where you're going to get your care, you need to trust and be committed to that team, right? So, so for me, my my commitment and my and my trust in Dr. Nali, her team, Dr. Santos, it was that's what allowed for me to be able to navigate this. Is again, don't overwhelm yourself. Get you know, start planning how you're going to do this, which is part of the reason why I'm doing this work because I want to tell people here's what you can use to be able to organize yourself. And then you've got to commit and trust, you know, into into your care, so that it can it can work for you in the best way. So that that's what I would say to people that are starting out. Thank you, um, Dr. Nolly. This question came in for you. How do you talk to patients about percentages? I remember our first meeting, we were trying to understand survival rates, and it made I made the mistake of searching the internet. Yes. Well, as a physician and as a researcher who publishes papers and uses statistics all the time, this can be very, very uh, confusing sometimes to read the internet. So uh, like I always say, breast cancer is not one type and each stage of cancer is different even within the stage. For example, patient with advanced cancer uh, there is a whole range of, uh, uh, of cases that each is different and each one has the potential to survive in a different way. So what they do for clinical research and clinical trials, they have to give a, an average or a median. So they can they kind of give an estimate. Okay. But if you look at the, at the actual, like say, for example, survival of stage four breast cancer can go anywhere from six months to 10 years or even more or even why 10 years, because this is when they stopped following, right? So it could be, of course, more. So that's what the results of the studies are. It's always limited by the, by the time the study is able to follow patients. Because I know from, we have 40 clinical trials now, and we don't follow these patients forever. We give a certain limit that we don't have an, an uh, unlimited supply of uh, coordinators to follow hundreds and thousands of patients throughout life, right? So we give an estimate and we give the year, the five-year survival that we are able to do. Mostly it's five years because that's how long studies follow patients typically. It doesn't mean that you're going to live only five years. It doesn't mean you're going to live only three years. It depends on this is how the study is done. So that can be a little bit confusing. So I give, I tell patients really it is not, uh, you know, it could be if a trial can give a 90% um, uh, ninety percent failure rate, and you could be from the ten percent who are going to be in the success range. So it's very difficult to to get stuck with statistics. Yes, it gives an overview. We don't want to also give fa false information, but at the, but take this with a grain of salt and know that it may not completely apply to you unless they have included patients just exactly like you. You know, the same age, the same lifestyle, the same body habits, the same environmental exposure, the same, uh, you know, exact type of cancer. It is impossible to give to know exactly. So take it. Yes, it's a general overview, but don't really get stuck with the numbers because it can be confusing and it can increase anxiety unnecessarily. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Nelly. Appreciate it. Um, the next question is for Dr. Santos. Um, for those that are seeking psychological therapy, what would you say are the key things to look for as they choose a psychologist? So, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So typically, uh, even in my consults, I ask uh, folks at the end of the meeting, hey, do you feel comfortable talking to me? And that's usually number one. And I, I got to say, as a professional, I, I kind of have <laughs> a good vibe 
go and when I when I talk to folks uh, during our consult. However, you know, mainly it's focusing on a mental health care professional that does have you know a specialization in let's say oncology. If that's one of the main reasons you're seeking help for, um, that can definitely be more beneficial than not. However, in general, most uh, healthcare, or sorry, mental health care professionals, we do have, you know, experience with depression, anxiety, uh, what we call in the field adjustment disorder, right, which is when you're faced with a terrible life circumstance, how do you adjust, how do you become a little bit more flexible, and how do we just, you know, cope with our reality in front of us. So having a professional that is focused on those type of things can be, you know, a lot easier to find. However, I know at different facilities around the nation, even in Florida, they do have folks like me um, in those facilities that you can be referred to. And, and they do have them even through insurances that you can ask, hey, are they a health psychologist? Because even if they aren't a psycho-oncologist, they can be a health psychologist, which is, you know, what we call the umbrella term, where a lot of, you know, different health issues are under. And so if we're more specialized in that, they can be a little bit more attuned to the things that people are going through, the side effects, let's say, from treatment, surgery, right, the recovery period, even that radiation, right? Uh, being more attuned to those things make it easier to talk about it, um, and again, reduce the stigma. So just finding someone you're comfortable with and have that has a specialization in what you're seeking care for, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question actually came in for Amelia. Um, Amelia, do you plan to support any other nonprofits besides Metaviver in the future? So the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we started with Metaviver because obviously it is, uh, you know, close to my heart. And as I, you know, start this endeavor, I wanted to be able to be very purposeful about the organizations that we, um, that we select and, and with whom we partner. Um, even though humble beginnings, but, you know, but it's always like that when, you know, I think when you start something special. So the intention that, that we have in the space of choosing people to whom we will donate um, is we will always have obviously an element of it that is attached to, to cancer. Um, it doesn't always have to be breast cancer, to be honest, because another organization that I have a really strong passion for is the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Um, and so that space uh, also is one in which I feel that through our efforts, we could also contribute. The intention that we have is to on a quarterly basis so that as we match our seasonal releases that we will also host uh, an event that does uh, inspire people to be able to donate and to be able to then take those proceeds and give to those organizations. Because I believe that you know, giving back and, and, and making an effort uh, to make it better in the space can help with what Dr. Nali and Dr. are talking about is, you know, the next wave of people that are, that are coming up behind and even those that are already in it, how do we continue to help them? So that's really the intention that we have in this space of charities and, and what we will do. That's wonderful. Well, we have time for one more question and it is for Dr. Nali. Uh, can you explain what complementary medicine is and why you think it is an important component of a patient's treatment plan? I'm sorry, Dr. Nali, you're muted right now. Okay. <laughs> there you are, I can hear you now. So uh, breast cancer treatment uh, requires three, three major types of services to be the best and the most successful it can be. Number one, it requires a multidisciplinary uh, team that is uh, people experts and specialists in their field uh, from surgeons to technicians to um, you know, therapists, etc. So that's a multidisciplinary team is a must have. The second thing is uh, to have a, the latest uh, uh, access to the latest treatment and technologies and advances in the field and drugs and medications. So that's number two. The third and more, and, and I, I would see as equally important uh, uh, is what we call supportive uh, care or holistic care, holistic approach. Uh, or some people call it complementary uh, uh, therapy. So that's really uh, targeting not just the body and the medical treatment, but the, also the, the mind and the, psycho the, the psychology, the mental health component. That's how I look at complementary uh, and support services. Some people call it integrative oncology. Some people call it uh, survivorship care. Uh, some people call it holistic care. So it's all the same. It is really trying to find additional 
uh, important services to help patients navigate through their journey with, with cancer. So uh, the complementary services that we have at Cleveland Clinic, for example, include psychotherapy, like what Dr. Santos has just uh, de described. We have support from social work. We have navigation. Uh, we have a whole list of uh, uh, therapists who are trained with cancer patients and for, for, for patients with cancer. Like, um, for example, we have a program called Beauty in the Face of Cancer to, to make sure patients look uh, look good and uh, with an esthetician who will support them with non-harsh material of uh, massage therapists and people who uh, give them art therapy, music therapy, uh, nutrition support, uh, genetic counselors. So yes, not everyone really goes through or, or uses these services, but they are available. And we are even uh, now uh, doing a clinical trial to see what if these services really actually benefit scientifically patients uh, with their cognitive, the chemo brain and other things. So that's what I believe is complementary therapy. I don't believe it should be, it should be an alternative therapy to, uh, to, to, to the standard traditional evidence-based treatment. It should be really complementary and complement whatever the, the physicians and the, uh, the medical team is doing. Thank you. Um, that will wrap up today's Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Nali and Dr. Santos. I will now turn it back over to Amelia to take it from here. Thank you very much, Jamie, for that. And thank you everybody for, um, for just the, the entire Q&A piece. I've got just a couple more pieces um, that I wanna share before we conclude today. Um, and, um, and just kind of, you know, and again, as, as, um, as Jamie indicated, anyone that has additional questions, we could absolutely, um, I'm sorry, we will share those questions once we, um, once we have uh, the website up. And so you'll be able to see that as well, which will be great. Um, so let me do one thing. I'm just switching gears a little bit here to, uh, to get to the screen that I want you guys to be able to see. And hopefully you can see my screen. Um, if you cannot, then just type up a quick note and let us know that if you're not able to do so, just give me one moment while I pause and switch gears. Hopefully you guys can see that okay. Uh, no, so uh, if you unshare this, Amelia, you'll have to view the full screen and then share it. Okay, one second, please. Let me try that and see if it'll allow it. Um, sometimes technology is our friend and sometimes technology is not. <laughs> I should have um, you on the website, Amelia, that um, anyone can submit questions directly on the website as well through the contact form. So if that is an easier way or you feel more comfortable doing that, we can certainly take questions that way. That is perfect. And then hopefully now you can see my screen once again. Yes. Excellent. So I wanted to uh, to just share a word of gratitude in addition to thanking the folks that joined today as, as presenters, Dr. Nali, Dr. Santos for their phenomenal care and the insights that they share today. I also wanted to take a moment to thank some of the people that have been involved in this work. You know, I often hear the expression, you know, someone is self-made or they did that and the other, and I just don't believe that anyone can be. I think you always need people to help you be able to, to get to the place that you're going and what that means uh, for, for your accomplishment. And so I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to express my gratitude for some of the folks that have been a core part of this team. So we've kind of had this uh, you know core team, if you will, of individuals that have been helping me with the development of this website, the, this whole project and this whole concept. Um, we've got some folks on, the, on this, you know, Alex and, and Steven and Susan, which we're we call the legal eagles, the folks that kind of keep us on the, on the straight path of, of being able to do this work legally and do it correctly. Um, we also have, uh, you know, Jamie Hahn, who you guys have met on this, on this webinar, who has been the engineer behind really getting the collection of people that have helped from the core team be able to do this. You know, Jamie's company is called ASI Consulting. I strongly, strongly support her in all of the future endeavors that her company takes on. They have helped me build this website, but also have been able to help with how do you start to get the word out and how you really start to do this work with integrity and with good excellence and grace. And so I'm so thankful for, for Jamie, for Catherine, for Rachel and, and Monique that are part of, of that core group. Um, my sister Lenore, who has always been the editor behind the scenes with all of this work, 
Rodney Jordan, who kind of connected me with all these people without whom we would not have known um, how to get all these groups together. That, that's really been the core group of people that have kind of been behind the scenes making all this content come to life. The focus group, as I affectionately call it, are people that I have leaned on to give me really hard feedback, to comb through this site, to be able to tell us what isn't good, what should be changed, what else is missing, what can you add? So throughout this, I've really leaned on Arlene and Amanda and Caroline and, and Derek and Linda and Meg and Michelle to kind of give me their perspective on how is this working or what isn't connecting. And they've done so in spades and they've given of their time voluntarily, which I so very much appreciate. And then really everyone on this call and the people that couldn't join the call, but that went out and made it a contribution to, to our, our cause here for Metaviver, I call the early ambassadors. Uh, I am again, so very th thankful and grateful for, for all of this. And, and obviously on top of all of that is, is Dr. Nali and Dr. Santos uh, as, as kind of the extensions of this great effort. Um, so that's my first kind of, you know, my, my gratitude and kind of a word of thanks for everyone that has been involved in this work. Um, we have the one final ask. Um, so in addition to the time that you gave us today and the money that you paid to get in, as well as the money that you donated, we thank you for that. Well, we got one more ask and I call this kind of the, the three S's. So we're, you're gonna send, we're gonna send you a link to the site. So again, you'll be able to get our site, www.thebreastcancerguide.com. We ask for three things. One, strengthen it. So tell us at least one thing that could be better. Two, share it, send the link to someone that you know, or many ones. So be a sponsor of getting the word out for us. And three, support it. So ask that same person or the many ones that you send it to, to also strengthen it, to share it and to support it. Because our intention is to continue to make this better. Our intention is to expand and really become a key hub in this space of helping people to navigate the journey of, of treatment and to do so with excellence and grace. And we want to be that central place in order to do that. We have to get better and we have to keep getting the best uh, into, uh, into what we do every single day. So th that is our ask for today. Take five minutes, please. You know, we're giving you back a little bit of time from, from when we originally said we'd be wrapped up with the call. So we'd ask you to just, you know, look at it, give us some feedback share it and then also support it and, and, uh, and share it to someone else. So with that, um, I thank you. We are How to Breast Cancer. We are thebreastcancerguide.com. And I am so thankful for you guys taking time today for being a part of this first of many terrific events. Many thanks to all the presenters. Um, and it's really with love that we sign off today. And we thank you for having been a part of it. Thank you so much, everyone. Be well and enjoy your Sunday.